at the Essex Hotel in Chicago on the, what is it today, the 14th? And we were with No, 14th. Yeah. Paul Sills. And uh, when you think about Compass, the first thing that comes to mind is Mo Hirsch. Who is Mo Hirsch? Mo Hirsch was a, a, a student at the University of Chicago in mathematics, I believe, and became a famous mathematician of some sort. At least I always thought so. And I don't know anything else about him, except he could play the guitar a little, and we used him in uh, in your scenario. In the minister's daughter. Minister's daughter, right. So I asked once, I asked um, Goldberger, Murph Goldberger, about Mo Hirsch. I said, is he an Islamic scientist? He said, he's a little one. He's, he's not big. He's not a little. big what? Atomic scientist. In other words, they got these guys ranked, okay, in the halls of atomic science. In famous... And uh, Murph Goldberger was at the top, and Mo Hirsch was at the bottom. Oh. So... Well, that could be, but I'd rather have Mo Hirsch, because he could play the guitar. Who is Chaim Bernson? Chaim Bernson was uh, a Jew. You have to be a Jew to be named Chaim Bernson. But he was a talented man. I've never met him since the compass, or even heard of his name mentioned. Well, he uttered a uh, sentence that I'll never forget. When he, we were doing the pot smoking scene yeah. for the minister's daughter, we gave a big party, and I, as the minister, had to be there because I was the host, right? And I came by shaking hands. Chaim Bernson said to me, Father, your tie is so long. And that stayed with me all these years. <laughs> yeah, well, he was a wonderful and very interesting person. I don't know what happened to him, but he was a University of Chicago person, so I assume he got a good job somewhere. Okay, let's go on. How about Coughlin? Robert Coughlin was a uh, was my boss at, uh, for a while there at... Uh, Something to do with the business school. Trubnik and I worked there. Trubnik really was an editor, professional editor. You know, Trubnik was working for Playboy, right? Through Second City. Right, he used to select the cartoons. Yeah, and other things. He could rewrite jokes, and I don't know what else. He, but he, he was, they used him all the time until he finally quit, or he left town. In fact, they gave me a job when I went to England. I don't know if they paid me. I think a little bit. The job was doing what? The job was to uh, freelance uh, write and something about uh, England, whatever uh, I could think of. But I don't think I ever thought of much. That I, that w would be interesting to play. Boy. But they were just beginning then. Yeah. Well, Andy Duncan used to say about me that I didn't expect anybody to have a, a job or make a living. I just expected them to work free for Compass for the rest of eternity. <laughs> Andy, yeah, well, he, he had his thoughts. He's still living in the same apartment, mine have told me. Or he Where? Must be, he should, he probably is. Would be about 98th or 9th along Central Park West, a, a, a series of, of uh, buildings that they built. Not, And he was like in the first wave of people that got apartments. Andy Duncan. He was the one who said what Compass was all about was cultural bandits. Uh-huh. Don't you think that you that's remember perfect? Everything that Andy Duncan ever said, you, you're, you're in good shape if you... You can remember Andy Duncan. I can remember not a phrase he said. I remember something he said <clears throat> doing the show on Lake Park Avenue. Is that the name of it? Lake yeah, Park Lake Avenue. Park. And uh, they're doing a scene about these uh, this couple who are having, um, uh, I guess, uh, a shower before they got married or something like that. And uh, one of the guests brought them a, st a stack of omelet uh, dishes or omelet. Omelet? Yeah, a stack. And Andy said, well, that's a good place to put our diaphragms. 
Well, I heard that Andy had said that. I was infuriated. I, I was Using just so into language in a public place. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, I, the I, word I, diaphragm. Yeah, right. The concept of people putting diaphragms in omelet dishes just turned me off totally. I went running down the street to tell them never to do that again. Uh huh. You ever well, have that experience? You have your ways, David. They were old-fashioned ways, as time has proved. Well, I was young. Yeah, I was a young man. The diaphragm occurs in TV shows. Yeah, right, right, they say everything. Hey, I, was, I was young. I was in my very early 30s, and I had an older mentality than anybody in the company. Well, you were older than anybody, mm. except maybe Andy Duncan. But I think he was also a couple years younger. He, he, he would be about 76 now. So you're 78. Tell me about Jim Sachs. Uh, I don't know Jim Sachs. I knew he did. He did uh, some kind of work with people over. From, but uh, you know, uh, I don't remember the word. The words. Some psychological testing work through improv semi-improvisational psychodrama psychodrama yeah. right well I remember that we did one field trip when we were at Compass so we went down to Mantino I think it was and we went into a room where a number of patients were exhibited to us one after another and we were supposed to figure out whether they were fake or real this was in Mantino what Illinois, Illinois? Yeah. I don't know that I, w I wasn't there for that that was after I had left on my uh, Fulbright. And Andy got them all right. I was there for the first eight or ten weeks of, of Compass. And then I went up to England. I had this scholarship. And it, uh, that was that. Okay, well, would you please explain to me, why did we start Compass? Well, I, uh, I think you had some thought or a vision about it that you, one could have a, a people's theater. Isn't that the idea? The pop, well, meaning ordinary people, working people, that, that it would reflect their ideas and so on. But of course everybody in the compass was at the University of Chicago. Well, yeah, you were all saying to me, well, we could get our parents to come. That would be a, you know, a big what? step. If we could get our parents, never mind the working people, if we could just get the parents to come, that would be the a big step. Came. There was uh, plenty of adults in the audience that, uh, that the, the entire faculty came. I understand Saul really? Bell came. Saul Bell. I don't know. I didn't know. I wasn't there that night. Mm -hmm. But I know that... Uh, Abner Bickford came. Who was the guy that was actually important writer? The the um, he did a uh, he did a um, the scenario. The liars he did. The liars, yes. His, Isaac Rosenfeld. Got it. Right, and he he came, and he, he gave us a scenario. That was a wonderful scenario. Right. Okay. He's done with Mike Severin. Shelley Berman was the the good the dupe, and uh, I think Andy was Andy. in it. Yeah. And I don't know another guy. It was written for <coughs> five <laughs> teachers. Five people. Only, and was Barbara in it? She played <coughs> the waitress in this their their hangout yeah. restaurant where they met. Anyway, I'm not going to tell the story because no, no. But the liars was a major piece, and the uh, I did the first scenario as director. I got to do it, which was based. It was uh, the game of hurt. I don't know if that was we called it that. That's right. It was about the couple that played the game of hurt, where they insult each other and. and um, Whoever can actually hurt the other person with what they say has a, the other person gets to say, 
point for me. And then you make a point on the wall. Is she signed her up? And it was, it was a game that didn't exist, did it? Or was no, 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 it never existed. But we were making a lot of games at the University of Chicago that didn't exist, right? Like Eng English style debating. You remember that one? Here, I'm going to turn this off. <coughs> well, what made Compass different from other cabaret theaters, comedy clubs, etc.? There wasn't anything else like it, and I'm nowhere near like it. When, well, when the remember those guys came from New York, somehow a week after, two weeks after Compass opened, a New York team of uh, filmmakers, documentary filmmakers sent from ABC or CBS came and shot us. I don't remember that. They were there. I don't think they ever used any of this stuff, but they it was they just wandered in. And they they said, well, this is just like it was back in um, Commedia dell'arte or the Roman Empire some such thing, but there hasn't been anything since like well, it. Why were we always co compared to Comedia? We had nothing well, to do with Comedia at all. They, 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 there was a, a myth that the Comedia was improvised. Actually, it was ad-libbed around a whole series of, uh, of comedians who had their bits. Yeah, like Lazzi, that was one kind Lazzi, of a bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well. And uh, so they not knowing anything about either the Commedia or what we did, that's what they said. But <clears throat> what, what, what I'm trying to ask you now is what made Compass Compass? What, what, what was there about it <coughs> that made it what it was? Well, the fact that it had improvised dialogue open to the public was was totally innovative. Now there's a million places where they do that. This festival right here today that we're not going to see much of has 40 groups coming from all over the world who are coming just in order to uh, get up and to make fools of themselves or maybe they'll do their Lazi very successfully. I don't know. But um, that's all since Compass. Yeah, right. Okay. Well, that's it. I mean, is there any more to say about it? It's just oh, I don't know. I have a, lo a bunch of questions, you know. Oh, keep going. And uh, one of them is, <clears throat> what was your favorite scenario? Well, I liked them all. I don't have favorite ones. I liked, uh, the, you, there was, um, the first one was this game of Hurt, which I, I, I was speaking of it, so I'll just finish it. It's not favorite or anything, but I... I took it, uh, the, the men, they fight each other, the man and the wife. They went to a bar, a local neighborhood bar, and um, uh, it ends up with the guy, the, the husband, drunk as hell, starts uh, trying to barter or sell his wife to who, the highest bidder. And some guy actually, uh, guy actually buys her. An innocent. He buys her, and then I don't know what happens. But there's the rest what of happens the scene after scene. He takes her. He takes her home. Bob Coffin was the guy who bought her, and he took her home. Right, took and her. And he wanted to make love to her. But the way she refused was by telling him stories that she could remember from the radio. Is it Martha Kent? Or Not North the camp, but something like that. Yeah. So, and then she said, oh, Seriously. I have to tell you what happened after that. And then she talked for <coughs> three minutes. And then he put his arm around her and she said, why well, tell you? And she'd get up and she'd... So that's the way she kept, kept him out of her pants. More innocent than anything ever since. I mean, it was super innocent. That was a, not a, a terrible story, but that was a, a steal from... The man who sold his wife in a bar to another man is from the Mayor of Casterbridge by Thomas Hardy, which I happened to have read that year. And I, so I just took that idea and we switched it, then made an American thing out of it with motorcycles and guys. But we didn't follow Hardy any further, just that one idea. But, but I lifted it from Hardy. I can't remember the ending, do you? Yeah, they they run away. 
The daughter, there's a daughter involved. Loretta kills you. Loretta. It should have been Barbara, but I was afraid that, uh, that people would think that I was prejudiced because she was my girlfriend at the time. And so, so I... But anyway. Loretta did fine. Loretta did fine, yeah. But she never did another step of work in the theater as long as she lived, you know. Yeah. And she's still alive, probably, wondering whatever happened. Yeah. Well, well, Barbara's gone on. What, what happened? The parents came home, were reunited, and then she came in, and then what happened? I don't know. Mm -hmm. It really doesn't matter what happens. What do you think? I think that's an important scene, but I can't remember it. It, you, it may very well be, David, but it's not really important to anybody but you. Mm. And so you, if you ever think of what it was, uh, let me know about it. I probably have a note or two on it. Well, I could do it if I wanted to go into it, but we we don't really want to talk what happened to the company and all those things. What The next one was um, the one you wrote. I like the ending of that, where the boy was Roger, got the girl, which was... Boy was Roger? Boy, boy. The, the boy was Roger Bowen. Roger didn't get the girl. He was the uh, brother. He brought the girl out of jail, and... They then went oh, he gets the father's you. girl. They, they took the father's car, and they just go off into the future. It's like a new generation. It's like, here we go into the 60s now. Goodbye. It had the first uh, marijuana scene in um, the American theater. This is the one that you wrote? Yeah, the smoking of marijuana. The minister's daughter. And no, I, I was the director, and I never had smoked marijuana, and I didn't know what it was and or anything about it. And somebody said, well, they turn off all the lights and pass it around. So we did the scene of them passing this cigarette, regular cigarette around uh, a table with about, I mean, a, a room with about six people or eight people on stage. And then the audience started to laugh when they saw this. So I realized that I was the last guy in America to know what uh, marijuana was. But nobody smoked it, really, around in the theater. No, Nobody. Mm. The only was Earhart. Mm -hmm. It was rumored to have smoked a little grass. But honestly, it was, uh, what year was that? 50, 54, 55. 54, 55. It was before it had really happened among white people. And we were certainly as hip as we could be. Yeah, right. Well, we thought we were, anyway. <coughs> could I ask you, what was your favorite character of all the characters that came through? Falstaff. No, I'm talking about in, in front of the, the developed by Compass. Oh, well, there were no favorite characters. I don't know. I mean, I only did about six or seven of them. The Minister's Daughter, that was a good one. Well, for characters, I thought Bob Coughlin had, was my favorite character when he played into the real you. The real you? I didn't see. He I played a dynamic um, trainer from the University of Chicago training all these people how to stop being what they were and become what he wanted them to be. Yeah, right. And he was so convincing. Well, yeah, you know, uh, he was talented linguistically, and he, uh, the sense of detail was great. He was very talented. So, <clears throat> there's one I ask you about. One mistake that I thought I made. When the actors went on strike, I made a mistake of keeping the theater open. I just wanted to know what you had to say about that. I wasn't there. I know nothing about it. You're talking about the Compass went on strike? Well, yeah. I was in England. Yeah. Well, there the Compass was at a different place. Was that, uh, that was on the north side yeah. you're talking about. It, the offbeat room? I can't remember where it was. Oh, it had to be somewhere like that. It was either in Lake Park or the Argo Offbeat Road. They struck for what? For minimum... Minimum uh, wage. wage. Minimum... Uni uh, equity. Equity minimum was yeah. about $50. 55 55 Did you finally give it to them? Yeah, it was a terrible mistake. It put me in debt automatically. Well, as a capitalist, you were... A loser. You never made a dime.
any of these theaters. They, there's been millions of dollars made off of this. David never got a dime, never got e any royalties. The, the merest agent that ever floated around it, not, not to mention producers, uh, that ever floated around Mike and Elaine or Shelley or whoever, the, the, with their acts, which were all developed at the Compass, uh, all the material was developed that way, David never got any percentage or any anything. So, you, you're the least of money makers. Right. <clears throat> the lowest money maker on the totem pole. You, you, you know what I'm saying? Most likely. But that was your, your nature. I mean, your background. Well, I mean, your background, in your revolt against your background. Supposing you wanted to uh, make a compass today in the Ashtabula or Chicago or wherever you happen to be in Door County, how would you how would you cast it and how would you train the cast? I'd do it exactly the same as I did. We just I just ran workshops and Viola's work for um, that I knew. I was I'm, I was the person who knew. Viola's work to some extent, and I, uh, I just, well, there was 15 or 20 people were in the workshop, and they met, what, every night in the week for a while there, yep. and we came all the way, Mickey used to drive uh, us from the, from the north side, those of us who were north siders, to the south side, and, and then we'd talk about it on the way home. Anyway, we, we, we worked it, and at the end of five or six weeks of this, or four weeks or six weeks, I don't know how much long, but... Well, your mother was there. She led the workshop, She right? She had another workshop. Oh. I had my workshop. She had hers, and Elaine had hers. They were all three different. Huh. And, and then you come out of that. Anyway, what I would do was, finally at the end of it, I said, here are the people who can do this. Bob Coughlin, Sid Lazard, who was, uh, uh, he could talk. He was, uh, he's still talking, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. I, I met him in New York. Have you ever seen him in New York? Not recently. Yeah, I, I uh, well, I did about six years ago or seven. He had two boys who wanted to be actors, and he was thinking of sending them to our school, but I don't, they never came. They went somewhere else. In any case, uh, uh, so, and Barbara Harris, and what's her name, Lorraine, and um, Loretta, did John Loretta, something like that. Loretta, she, she, they, she was okay for the part, but she was not a humorist. As soon as Barbara came and started doing things, it per perked up a great deal from the female side. Although Elaine, of course, was. Uh, what about <coughs> that? Um, Wonderful. That uh, coterie that came from, I believe, Rochelle, Leah Rochelle, and it included Bobby Nippy. Leah, and, Leah and, Rochelle uh, was this very heavy woman. Yeah. Jewish woman. Yeah. From the North Side. What about? Her? Didn't she send us uh, Annette Hankin and Bobby Nippy? Well, she might have, but they were just people. I mean, they weren't really actors. They're school teachers, and stuff like that. I mean. You had Barbara Harris and Elaine May, who were still more or less in, in Elaine is still in it, working. She just had a show in New York. I saw it. Yeah. Nancy and I went to the show in New York. Yeah. Well, there you are. And you saw Elaine afterwards. Yeah. Good. And she was, she goes to see all her shows. She happened to be there. She probably goes to see all of them there. Yeah. Anyway. Did you call us uh, to get our sandwich? They said it would be, probably won't get here until about four. That's fine. <clears throat> and I ordered you a coffee because... That doesn't work. Frosted. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. So uh, put there, together. How do I, how, what I would do, what he, uh, just what anybody would do. You find the most, the talented people around. And then you see if you can get some material out of them or or you, uh, whatever. 
I had uh, to start the Second City. I had uh, Trubnik and uh, Andy, and they really are actors, not improvisers. They never quite freed themselves to be able to. They they were always in their heads about it, as we say in the game. And um, Severin, when Severin came along, there was somebody who could who, who could freely verbalize and just. And um, Barbara, but the girls, there were some girls there that were not bad. Melinda Dillon was in that workshop. She's still at it. And um, in fact, she won a Tony Award, not much later than that, for acting. And you're talking about the of Virginia <coughs> Woolf. You're talking about the workshop in 1954? Yeah. Huh? No, she wasn't in that one. She was in the workshop to start Second City. That's, yeah. a, that's a different thing. But when you uh, say material, what do you mean material? You mean scenarios? Well, you had the idea of doing scenarios. That's a compass. That's a, I mean, a, a commedia idea. So we thought, well, if it's a commedia idea, it must be good. So you say, why do they re regard us as a compass? Why did you want a scenario? That was clearly a compass a, a comedia thing. They had scenarios of eight or ten scenes, and then in it they would go and do their business, their lotsy, as he uh, reminds me. And um, uh, these, these were ad libbers is really what it amounts to, clever guys, and they could juggle, and they could sing, and they could do bits, and so on. Well, what's the difference between ad libber and, and improviser? I think I know, but I'd like you to say. Well, I don't. I don't really know. What do you think it is? It seems to me the improvisation <coughs> changes the action. So. Oh. Uh, so all of a sudden, I, I develop a totally different relationship to Carol. Carol is now my sister, whatever, you know, and that's a um, bunch of improvisation. Where ad lib is, I just beat my gums at Carol, and she beats her gums at. Relation, relationship rather than a yeah. subject, object. Could you pick up Carol's voice when she says that, please? Sure. Thank you. Carol, what is it you were saying? There? You're saying it, it's the difference between um, having an, a subject-object relationship ad lib. You use the other one to bounce your own ideas. You never, there's no interaction or interplay. We saw it in, in L.A. They were doing at the Friars Club. It couldn't have been three months ago, two months ago, out there in Beverly Hills. Uh, all the old Second City people that were out there that wanted to be in this, they'd play them in groups of uh, seven on a side, and maybe they had four teams there. We uh, we only sell one. Shelley was there that night, Shelley Berman. They invited him, and they invited me. And Carol, we went. But um, that was all ad lib. One guy would come out and he'd say this and that, and the other guy would come and play with the words. It was like Del Close's stuff. It's all play, play, play of ad libbing. It wasn't acting, it wasn't theater. And uh, they never even got laughs. I mean, they did get laughs, but that's just support from. Their, their, their friends, but that one really wasn't funny, and it wasn't interesting. It wasn't much of anything. It was just blather. I can see that it could be a lot better, but they never got it up to the point where anybody would stand for it. But that's ad libbery carried to the, the ad libbery, uh, uh, yeah. an extreme. And, uh, I I don't encourage it, or I'm not interested in it. Now I remember that at the same time we were doing Compass, there was another group down the street, led by a man named David Daniels, who thought that Compass was the most reactionary thing he had ever seen in his life. He had, reactionary. Yeah, he said I think he had Katie Perkins in that company. About six of them. They were right off the wall. 
You, you ever know anything about them? I knew David Daniels. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That would be a story. And here we thought we were being very <coughs> avant-garde, and they were saying, "You're passe, baby. We're we're doing it. You're doing nothing." Well, they're, they're just talking. They were just talking. They weren't actors. They weren't theater people. They were uh, cultists. Daniels turned him into a cult in New York. You must have met him in New York. Oh, you? yeah. He's in Boston now. Yeah. But they, that, uh, I don't think, I mean, he was intelligent. And they, but they all sl slept together, lived together. It was like a cult. Uh, that All cults are like that. And they all sleep with the uh, the leader. If it were it's Daniels, it, then they were all sleeping with Daniels. It's just kind of um, sickening, I think. Not avant-garde. I'm not not that avant-garde, and I I was not interested in um, 